Good morning. Good morning. Oh man, let's try again. Good morning. So there you go, Rick. See, everybody needs to follow Ricky's lead. So, hey, before I get started, before I dive into this new series, I want to talk to you for just a moment. Scott just said something so powerful. He said, I want to quit, but my calling keeps me going, right? Being in ministry, whether it's a pastor or whatever, it's hard. It's extremely hard. Extremely hard. I remember when... <clears throat> Scott came, and we were at the other building. He led worship. I don't know if he remembers that Sunday. I texted him. I said, you're going to be my worship leader, whether you want to or not. <laughs> and God called him here. Scott and I have done ministry for years. But if I'm being honest, and I think Ricky can attest to this. I know Quentin can attest to this. There will come a time in your life where you want to quit and not just where you're at, but ministry, period. It's hard. There's those times where you want to go on Facebook and be like, y'all are all idiots. <laughs> but you're a pastor. Can't do that. There's those times where people call you to pray and I don't, don't stop calling me to pray. I want you to call me to pray. And sometimes you just want to be like, I could pray for you, but you could just suck it up, buttercup, and life will get better. <laughs> but you can't do that. Ministry is how we could. <laughs> Ministry is hard. I want to encourage you guys to make sure that you are praying for those that pour into you. I'm not just talking about me. I'm not just talking about Scott. I'm talking about leaders of this world. Because each and every single moment of our life, we are literally being attacked. And it's hard. And, and <clears throat> here's the thing. You look and you think, man, if I just pull the plug on all this Jesus stuff that I'm doing, life will be easy. I'll just go to church. I'll just be a member. And we'll just go on with life. I did that at church at the well. And all of a sudden, they were like, they were building a backdrop. And I said, I'm going to come help y'all build that backdrop. All of a sudden, I was speaking and I was running sound and helping with youth. And I was like, what happened? When Jesus, the calling of Christ, is in your DNA, you got no other choice but to run, whether you want to or not. So make sure that you're praying for these guys. Make sure that you're praying for Scott. Make sure that you're praying for Quentin. Make sure you're praying for Joey and Logan and Lane and everyone that has their hand in Theo and especially Brian. <laughs> make sure you're praying for them. Because it's hard, but not just them. Listen, not just them, but our wives too. Because they see, see, this is the thing that people don't understand. Our wives see the ugly when you don't. Our wives see us when we're beaten down. And, 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 and for wives that's in ministry, your husbands, they see you when you're beaten down. They see you those moments when you're weak and you're crying. And they see you in those, those moments where you just want to throw in the towel. And they're our biggest cheerleaders. But can I tell you, it wears on them just as much as it wears on us. So when you're praying, make sure that, number one, you're praying for, for that leader. But make sure you're praying for their spouse. Make sure you're praying for their family. Can we do that? Amen. 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 Let's dive into this new series. It's called, Who Stole My Thanksgiving? See, and it's so easy. This is the thing that I love about Thanksgiving. Because you go on social media, everybody's like, Day one, the thing I'm thankful for. And we make it all beautiful and all cheerful and all this and all that. I remember one year somebody sent me that challenge. I was like, cool, I'm going to do this challenge. And I said, day one, and you had to use a black and white photo. I put a black and white photo of me and a black and white photo of a hot Krispy Kreme donut sign. And I said, I'm so thankful for the hot Krispy Kreme donuts because they never let me down. And my wife was like, are you serious? And then I put day two, day two, I put a picture of me without a haircut and a picture with me with a haircut. And I said, I'm so thankful for my barber because he always got me looking good. And then day three, I put a picture of the Facebook. And so day three, I'm thankful for Facebook because it always gives me challenges to keep me busy. And, and everyone else was like being all serious. I'm so thankful for, for the air that I can breathe. 
Because the air that I breathe, it helps me to see that God is powerful. I'm so thankful for my spouse because my spouse is there through the good times and the bad times. And, and I know that we've had our rough patches, but I can never see life without you. And I'm sitting up here reading this like, you lying. <laughs> you, you lying. You know that there's that time in your life where you look at your spouse and be like, I should have listened to my mama. You know. Now, that's if we be real. I'm so thankful for my kids. I, I hate that they're growing up so fast. Most of us got a khaki or, or on our calendar. This is the date the last one leaves for college. And y'all push them through high school and through elementary school and say you got to make good grades, not so that they can have a good future, but you push them through because you want them out the house. But see, this is what pastors do. This is what we do. We, we say it's Thanksgiving, so we're going to be thankful. And we read 1 Chronicles 16, 34. And we say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his love endures forever. And then all of a sudden we expect for our, our members to be like, life is great. But can we be honest that you are thankful for your kids, but sometimes your kids get on your nerves? Somebody felt that this morning. Y'all had that real Sunday morning experience. Hallelujah. Y'all felt that more than you felt anything you heard today. But we get that way. And sometimes it's like, I'm thankful for my spouse. But see, like if, you're, if I was your spouse and we were on a road trip, I like to just have the car quiet. I don't like getting noise. I'm like, my wife, we can be driving the floor to eight hours. She's like, you want to cut on music? Mm-mm. You can ask my kids. Thankful for you and your love for old hip hop. I'm looking at her saying, if I could drop you off at the next gas station, know you're safe, I would. But that's, that's the way it is sometimes. But, but it's easy for us to, to understand that we're supposed to give thanks to the Lord. For some of us, the only time we give thanks to the Lord is when we're sitting in front of our meals. But when the Bible says give thanks to the Lord, it's not talking about with our words, it's talking about with our actions. It's talking about with every single moment of our life. And it gives us a reason as to why. Here's the reason why he said, for he is good. If you've gone to the old churches or if you've watched some new churches, they say God is good. And all the time. And we say it, but do we truly believe it? And here's the other part. It gives us another reason. It says, listen, his love endures so why do we put a cap on that? Why do we put a cap on the love for God? You're like, I don't put a cap on the love for God because I know that God loves me. And see, for some of us, we say that, but our actions so different. We say God loves me, but then our Facebook post shows something different. We say God loves me, but the way that we treat others, it shows something different. And you're like, no, nah, that's not true. I love God because God is the center of my life. Listen, I'm a pastor, and I had to get off Facebook because I was getting rowdy. I was starting to forget that I was a pastor during this pandemic. I was in this Facebook group, and I'm not going to tell what the name of the group is. Scott knows the name of the group because he saw the posts. <laughs> yeah, he saw, he saw the comments. So I'm sitting on this page, and they're sitting up here like, COVID's fake. And I'm like, you're stupid. That was my response. I didn't have any scripture to go with it. They'll be like, COVID's not real. You're stupid. That was just my response. And I said, what is happening? And I would come here on Sundays and I would sing joyful noise to Jesus, say, God is good. And I would get up here and preach and, and all that kind of stuff until we shut down. And I was in my, my office preaching, which was a whole weird experience. But I was preaching and I was believing the word of God. And, but on Facebook, I was like, you're stupid. And I would go out in public and, and somebody would cough in, in the aisle and I would give them that look like, are you serious right now, for real? Or that one time that me and my wife, we went on an anniversary trip. And we're sitting up there and we're checking into this hotel. My wife got a hotel room because she's a nurse. We got a hotel room for free. I was like, we going. I don't care when we got to leave. We'll leave the kids some Cheetos and some Cheerios and we out. 
So we hop in the car, we get to the hotel, we're checking in, everything is great. And then all of a sudden this dude, and this is at the peak of COVID, this like June, and this dude gets in, a, in the elevator and he goes, ah, ah, a <laughs> I'm like, Rena, I'm going to go beat the brakes off this dude. He know we in COVID season. But where was the love of God at that moment? See, when I say that, it says, for he is good and his love endures forever. And we're supposed to be the living, breathing replication or a reproduction of Christ. Why do we place a cap on his love? Christ never placed a cap on his love for us. So if we're supposed to be the spitting image of our father, why do we place a cap on his love through us for others? When we go through this series, Who Stole My Thanksgiving?, I want us to break down different aspects of our life. And the reason I want us to break down different aspects of our life is because, can I tell you that a loss of love does not happen overnight? We don't, love, we don't learn to hate in seconds. We learn to hate in, in, in marathons or in moments. Hate is not something that a kid comes out of the womb knowing. It's something that a kid is taught over a period of time. Racism is not something that you learn from memes on Facebook. It's something that was buried in your heart because somebody planted the seed and you've allowed society to water it and watch it grow. You see, so as we go through this, we're, we're going to talk about different things. We're going to talk about joy, and we're going to talk about peace, and we're going to talk about faith, and we're going to talk about salvation, and we're going to talk about uh, uh, endurance and things like that. We're going to talk about these different things. But, but the thing that I want you to focus on is this, is not who stole my thanksgiving, but who stole my thanks, because that's the important thing that I want you to focus on. Who stole my thanks? Because if you have a heart of gratitude to Christ, then what happens is all that negativity that's in your heart is filled with him. So you're telling me that when I went on Facebook and I was calling people stupid that it wasn't Christ speaking through me? No. No. You're telling me this week that when I told somebody that, that they, were, they were either Republican or Democrat, that, that they're the downfall of the world, that that wasn't Jesus? No. You're telling wait a second. So what you're telling me that, that I can't hate the person that cut me off on the freeway while I was eating my Jesus chicken and they made me drop my mini Jesus chicken nugget? No. So this week or throughout this series, my hope and my prayer is that we get refocused. If you watched the prayer earlier this week, I talked about how we as a body of Christ were no longer focused on him. And since we're not focused on him, we've lost our, our communication with him. And we're looking at everything else and we're allowing it to determine how we react and how we act with others. Today we're going to talk about joy. And the reason why I want to talk about joy today is number one, <clears throat> because God told me to. But number two is because a lot of people, I feel that they've lost their joy during this entire pandemic and election year. And we're not talking about finding joy in things. You'll lose joy because of things. If you find joy in, in, in your house and that house burns down, then your, house, your joy goes with that house. If you find joy in your money and that money goes away, then all of a sudden your joy goes away. Listen, here, here's something crazy. If you find joy in North Church and we decide to close the doors tomorrow, your joy will go away with it. That's why the Bible tells us in James 1, 2, three, James 1, 2, and 3, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brother and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your face, faith produces perseverance. What is that saying? It's saying that as I go through things, Christ is strengthening me. So my joy can't be found in the things that I go through or in the things that I have. My joy has to be found in Christ because he's the person that's going to make sure that my joy is sustained as I go through things. When COVID first started, I remember my, my joy was found in the fact that I didn't have COVID. <laughs> I remember my joy was found in the fact that I was not a number or a statistic or anything like that. And any time I got a sniffle, I was like, this is the big one. I'm about to die. Amen. So when my Quentin knows. 
So when my health began to go, my joy began to go. My joy when I was first met my wife, my joy was found in my, my well, my, she was my girlfriend at the time. But I remember the one time she said, I think we need to see other people. I was like, no! No! It was this bad. I actually had a job at the same place that she had a job, and they saw me acting a fool out there in the parking lot, and I no longer had the job at that place. It was that bad. But that was because my joy was found in my wife and not the person that gave me my wife. So my wife's not going anywhere, so I want to preface this next statement with that. But if my wife was to go, my joy is not found in her. My joy is found in Christ. Watch this next scripture right here. It says this, Psalms 47, 1, it says, clap your hands, all you nations, shout to, cry, shout to God with cries of joy. And what you have to understand is Psalms was written in a very weird time. It was written in a time where, where things were not perfect in the life of the, of the person that wrote it, the musician David. It was not perfect. And here he is. He's like, clap your hands, all you nations, find joy in Christ. And he's telling them that. And I'm, 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 I'm reading this like, how? How can you tell them to clap their hands when you're going through hell? And, and, and I'm sitting up here trying to understand and process how he does that. And what he understood was that God still had him even in the midst of his mess. And it's taken me a long time to get there, but I've come to this realization that no matter what I go through, God has still got me. I remember Thanksgiving years ago. We usually do Thanksgiving, a friend's giving at my house, and we cook turkeys and all this good stuff. We have a ton of food at my house. And they came over, Lamont and all my other brothers came over with their families, and we all ready to eat. All the food is ready to go, and Lamont can attest to it. All this food is ready to go. We started making plates. I was like, somebody get the turkey out the oven. Somewhere between 6 o'clock that morning and 6 o'clock that evening, somebody cut the oven off. And there was a raw turkey sitting in our oven. Part of me was like, well, can you really have Thanksgiving without turkey? Let's just pray over and eat it. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. So we turned this turkey on, and and me and the guys, we had this idea. Let's just turn this thing on. The women were like, it's going to take forever to cook. You can't have Thanksgiving without a turkey. We will have a turkey. Here we are, we're all sitting in the house and we're eating like we're vegetarians. My wife and kids are having a field day because they don't eat meat anyway. They're just like, yeah, this is a good Thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but a plate without meat on it is not food. <laughs> and I'm sitting up here like, where the turkey at? But even during all this time, listen, we were laughing and joking. And we were like, somebody go check on the turkey. Ha, ha, ha. At midnight, midnight, these dudes are packing plates to take home because now the turkey is ready. We were able to laugh and joke and have fun in that moment. Why? Because we knew that at some point in time, the turkey was going to be ready. Can I tell you something, that the reason why this is written in Psalms, the reason that he says, clap your hands, all you nations, shout to God with cries of joy, and he didn't say, as long as everything is going perfect, the reason that he said is is because he understood that at some point in time, all things were going to work together for good. But why do we have a loss of joy in our life? Because we forget that no matter what we go through, all things, We'll work together for good. Here's the, here's the caveat to that. For those that are in Christ Jesus. Wait. So what you're telling me is that all things are going to work out. All things. Absolutely. The doctor said that I've got terminal cancer. All things work together for good. Me and my husband and I, we're going through it. All things will work together for good. Man, you don't understand. The devil is taking me through the ringer. All things will work together for good. 
So what does he mean by clap your hands? What does he mean? All you nations just shout to God. What he's saying is even in the midst, middle of my mess, I will never forget that there's a message. And that message is this, is that even though God is still good. So I'm not going to allow this moment to steal my joy. Let's pray. Father God, as we dive into your word, pray our minds are clear, our ears are open, our our, our hearts are receptive to what you're going to speak to us this morning. I pray that this morning that those that have allowed things of this world to steal their joy, they'll find them. They'll find it. And you'll restore it. Why? Because in the end, all things work together for good. Bless this service. Bless every word that's going to come out of my mouth. In your precious and holy name, and all God's children said, and amen. We're going to be studying on Acts chapter 16, and I've talked about... Paul and Silas in prison before, and I'm sure some of the other guys have talked about it, but I want to look at it from a different perspective. And we're going to sort of kind of skim through different parts of the story because this is the opener of our series. So I'm not going to hold you that long. And I know I say that all the time, but today I mean, it. I'm not going to hold you that long. But if you look at the story of Paul and Silas, what happened was they saw a young girl who was a fortune teller. Then this young girl kept pestering her, pestering him, pestering him, pestering him. And Paul, through the power of Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he delivered her of what was going on. Well, the guys who were using her for money, for his own, their own selfishness, they did not appreciate that. And now we look at Acts 16, chapter, verse 22, and it starts off like this. It says, the crowd joined in attacking them because they took them to the, the town or the middle of the town, and they began to attack them. And it says, the crowd joined in attacking them. And the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. In verse 23, it says, and when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in an inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. Can I tell you something that when a stranger hurts you, it doesn't hurt as bad when someone that you love hurts you? I was walking into a gas station and it was shortly after they announced that Biden was leading. And I'm walking into the gas station. And this guy randomly don't know my name and I don't know him. And I'm having a good day and I'm walking in. Do, 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 do. He said, I bet you're happy, aren't you, Snowflake? And I was like, I'm still trying to figure out where, where you get Snowflake from. I am the darkest snowflake <laughs> ever. So this is what I do. I say, hey. He was a skinny little guy. People get brave around election year. And he tensed up a little bit. He turned around. That's what I said, no lie. Everybody in the gas station, wait for me to swing on nobody. I said, snowflakes are beautiful and you have a blessed day. <laughs> and everybody in the gas station starts busting out laughing. So I get up to the, I'm paying for my stuff, and cashier goes, man, I thought you were going to hit him. I was like, why would I waste my time on that guy? But here's something else that happened. There was a, a buddy of mine, and me and him, we, we had a disagreement, and he blocked me on everything, social media, telephone, everything. We had been friends for years. We had done ministry together. We've traveled together. Now, listen, <clears throat> he didn't call me out of my name or to me, he didn't call me out of my name. He didn't do any of that stuff. Can I tell you that that hurt a lot more than the person that physically stood in front of me and called me a snowflake? Can I tell you that, that when the guy, when the kid hit my car, that the little 18 year old kid hit my car and it damaged, I mean, just bowed in the back of my car. I, I, that didn't hurt me as bad as when I just got the car back and my daughter put two scratches in it. When my daughter put scratches, I was like, it's the end of the world. Why would you do this? Why, why don't you love me? And that whole day I'm mad. That whole day, I'm like, are you serious? She put a, a scratch in my, do you see this scratch? I don't see the scratch. Let me get the magnifying glass. Do you see this scratch? 
But it hurt me because I knew her and, 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 and I had done so much good for her. And I allowed that moment to steal my joy. And Paul and Silas, they come into the city and they think they're doing something good. This young girl, she needs healing. And they do it. And all of a sudden, it backlash and, and, and it turns on them. And then all of a sudden, people start beating them up. And not just people, but the leaders of that, of that town, they say, let's beat them with rods and tear their clothes off. And they're sitting in the middle of the city and they're beating them to a pulp. Then it says that that wasn't enough. So they didn't just throw them in jail. They threw them in to the inner jail, which is a jail inside of a jail. The deepest, darkest, scariest place. And for some of you, you live in that place because you've allowed things in your life to steal your joy. You've allowed family to steal your joy. You've allowed friends to steal your joy. You've allowed church members to steal your joy. You've allowed your finances to steal your joy. You've allowed your job to steal your joy. You've allowed your circumstances around you to steal your joy. And you walk around in this inner prison not even realizing that there's so much more on the other side of the wall. So here he is. And I say, throw them in the inner prison. I'll never forget the time when my wife told me she was pregnant the first time. And I was like, uh. And I couldn't find joy in that moment because we were not married. And I remember <clears throat> thinking, what are these pastors going to think about me? What is my family going to think about me? What are these promoters that I do shows for going to think about me? What is my management going to think about me? What are these people who I've led to Christ, what are they going to think about me? And I could not find Christ or joy in that moment because I allowed others to steal my joy. They hadn't even said nothing to me. They hadn't even said, you're a horrible Christian, you're a horrible person, I can't believe, blah, blah, blah. They hadn't even said that. They they hadn't said nothing at all to me. Most of them did not even know, and here I am, and and I'm sitting up here, and and I'm not able to look at the cross and find grace and find mercy in the middle of my sin because I'm so focused on them, and I forgot that my joy is not found in people. My joy is found in Christ. And here's Paul and Silas, and they got two options in this inner cell. They can die or they can die. What do you mean they can die or they can die? They can die to their circumstances or they can die to Christ. Can I tell you that thankfulness is only found when you learn to die to Christ? What do you mean by die to Christ? That means I find my joy and I find my hope in him. That means that when, 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 when my family turns their back on me, I, it, it can't shake me. It can't rattle me. Why? Because they didn't give me my joy and they can't take it away. When my friends stab me in the back, it, it don't shake me because they didn't give me my joy and they can't take it away. When COVID hits the church and people that usually come to the church don't come to the church, and I'm okay with it. Some of them are watching online. Some of them just decided church ain't for me, and that's fine, and that's dandy. But here's the thing. Those people did not give me my joy, so they can't take it away. Listen, if my kids decide to go out there and while out, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to be there for them. But the thing is, is that they're not going to steal my joy that's found in Christ because they didn't give it to me. And they can't take it away. See, I'm going to be a Paul and Silas. What do you mean by you're going to be a Paul and Silas? Watch. It says this, verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. So the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bounds, and everyone's ba- bounds were unfastened. Can I tell you something that when you realize where your joy comes from and you return to that place, it's not just some simple, oh, I'm happy again. God will turn your life upside down and show you some things about yourself, show you some things about others. But when it's all said and done, you see the beauty that can only be found in him. 
See, so many times we, we preach this sermon and we're like, yeah, the walls fell down and I'm guilty of it too. We're like, man, this is awesome. This is great. But can I tell you something? That if I'm sitting in Taco Bell and all of a sudden the wall starts shaking, I'm not going to be like, yes, God, you're moving. Yes, Lord, you move. I'm going to say, oh, we're going to all die because it's an earthquake. And the doorway ain't big enough for all of us. So watch what happens. Paul and Silas they start singing praises to God. You notice how the Bible didn't say that they looked around and realized that they were in jail and began to complain about it? You notice how the Bible did not say they looked around and saw the circumstances that they were in and they began to blame God? You notice how the Bible did not say that, that they began to look around and see how dark it was and say, God, why have you forsaken me? The Bible says that at about midnight, they were praying and singing hymns and the walls began to crumble. Watch why, why, why this is so important because on verse 27 it says, When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors uh, were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out of verse 38 with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear he fell down before Paul and Silas. Can I tell you something? Here's the beauty that happens when you learn how to clap and praise God in the middle of your trials in the middle of your, or your circumstances, in the middle of your darkness, where you don't allow things around you to steal your joy. Here's the beauty in all that. When you, when you keep your joy and you say, God, you're still good regardless of what I'm going through, other people notice. Other people notice. Other people notice when they try to tear you down and break you down, but yet you still can say God is good. Other people notice that when you're going through some things and they know what you're going through, but you can still say God is good. Other people notice that when you, when, when you and your husband are fighting, but you can still worship together in church. Other people notice. Other people notice when you can get on social media instead of talking about I hate life and everything about it, but you can get on social media and say God is good. Other people notice. Other people notice, and they're shocked by it. This jailer said, how on God's green earth did this happen? He was ready to take his own life because he said, I messed up. But watch what happens. Paul and Silas, he said, no, 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 we're still here. And then what happened was is this. It says, then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, and they said, believe the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all that were in his house and took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once and all his family. And then he brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that God, that he had believed in God. Why is it important for us to find joy? even when we don't feel like it, because the world is watching. We've got options right now. We can give the world what everybody else has given them. We can argue and we can fight and we can bicker and we can give Facebook and Instagram and, and, and whatever else you're on, Snapchat or whatever else, or you can give society a piece of your joy. See, you can, you can allow those family members that have, that have just hurt you and scorned you. You can, you can, you can say, Here, here's a piece of my joy. You can allow those, those friends that have turned their back on you. Here, here's a piece of my joy. And you can keep giving this to them. Every little tiny piece. But can I tell you something? That eventually you're going to run out of that joy. Eventually you're going to run out of it. So how do I not get to that point? How do I not get to the point where I give up on God? Because I've given others my joy. You say that even though God is still good. And even though I'm in one of the deepest, most darkest places of my life, I'm not going to forget where my joy is found. I'm not going to forget where my joy is found. Can I tell you something? I love North Church and I love you all, but my joy is not found in my position here. I love my wife and I love my kids, 
but my joy is not found in being a husband and a father. I love being a business owner. I love doing ministry outside of church, but my joy is not found in that. The only reason that I'm able to stand up here every Sunday and preach, the only reason that I'm able to lead my family, the only reason that I'm able to lead a company that is based on the principles of Christ, the only reason that I'm able to walk outside of this building and go to other places and speak or go to other places and perform, the only reason that I was able to maintain my composure when that guy called me a snowflake, because my joy is not found in things that are carnal. My joy is found in Christ. Come on up here, Scott. This morning, I don't know what your inner cell is. I don't know what your inner cell is. I don't know what you have allowed in your life to steal your joy. But I do know this, is that no matter how deep or no matter how dark the place is that you're in, God is there and he wants to restore you. Wait, watch this. The Bible says it this way in Romans 15, 13. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in who? Him. So that you may overflow with what? Hope by the power of of the Holy Spirit. Listen, I want to read that again. May the God of hope, I don't know what hopelessness you're feeling this morning, but I want to tell you this, my God, he brings hope to your hopelessness. Watch this. May he fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in your family. Nah. As you trust in your friends, as you trust in your political party, as you trust in your finances, as you trust in your relationship status. See, it doesn't say that. It doesn't tell me that I have to depend on what I see. It says I depend on him to find my joy. And when I do that, it says this. It says, so that you may overflow. Remember how I said earlier, if you got the love of God, that's going to, you're going to show that to others. Romans tells me, it says that, that he's going to fill me, that I may overflow with hope. I don't know about you, but I look at a world surrounding us. And I see a world that needs hope. So how do I give it to him? I find my joy. I find my hope. I find my peace. That's in him. Now watch what it says. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you that every time you allow something to steal your joy, you place a value on it. Well, you don't understand. My, my friends, they did this. My, my family did this. That church member, they did this. And now all of a sudden you place a value on it. Austin, Austin told me that I was a horrible pastor. How much you worth, Austin? Probably about a million dollars, right? And all of a sudden, my joy is worth a million dollars. Lamont tells me, oh, you're a terrible Christian, a terrible friend. <laughs> eh. But now I allow him to place a value on my joy. This morning, North Church, whether you're here or whether you're watching this live stream, I want you to watch this last slide right here. This last slide, it says it all. My joy isn't for sale. This morning, I, I don't know what you've sold your joy out to. I don't know what cell you're in. Let's get real. Let's get real. Y'all ready for a moment? Listen, some of y'all, you sold your joy out to sex. Oh, I got I to gotta, I gotta feel the intimacy with a person. Oh, I got I to gotta be with a person or I don't know who I am and I don't love myself. Some of y'all, you sold your, your joy out to relationships. And, oh, if I just had a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or a wife, you living out this fairy tale. Can I tell you something that after the honeymoon is over, real life kicks in. 
Then the work begins. The hard part begins. Some of you, you sold your joy out to church and you come to church and Scott doesn't sing your favorite song or I don't preach a message that hits you the way you thought it should and all of a sudden you're like, man, today I thought that was going to be good but today wasn't all that great and then you sell your joy. I need for you to say in your heart and in your mind and with your life, my joy is no longer for sale. It's no longer for sale. I'm not looking for likes and accolades. I'm looking for my daddy. And if it's your midnight hour, you've been sitting in this cell for so long, you say, man, I'm ready to be free. This morning, it can happen. How? Give it to God. Give that hurt to God. Give that betrayal to God. Give that shame to God. Give that anger to God. Give that unforgiveness to God. Because can I tell you that while you're holding all this on and you've given them your joy, they still live in life. While Paul and Silas were sitting in jail, the people that beat them still live in life. Still live in life. That person that broke your heart, guess what? They still live in life. They still live in their life. They're not worried about you right now. They're not losing any sleep over you right now. But can I tell you somebody that will never sleep on you? His name is Jesus. And he's waiting to give you your joy back. So this morning as we worship, my prayer is this, is that you realize that these altars are open and they're not just open just so you can come up here and put on a show. They're open so that you can truly find your joy this morning. So let's stand, let's worship, let's give it to God this morning. Walking around these walls And I thought by now they'd fall But you may never fail me again Waiting Knowing the battles won't, you will never fail me again. Promise to your stays, great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. Still in your hands, this is my confidence. You never fail me. Yeah. I know the night won't last. Your word.
So listen, the Bible tells us in Acts 16 that God allowed the walls to crumble in their life. Can I tell you something this morning? That God can crumble the walls in your life that you have built up yourself or allowed others to build up, build up in your life. God can crumble them. But only God and God alone. This morning, I want to pray with you. And I know every Sunday we, we do, we, we do a, a, a call for salvation. And of course, we're going to do that. But I want to stop and, and I want to pray with you before we do that. That God restores your joy. That God restores your happiness and that it's not found in, in, in circumstances or tangible things, but that it's found in him. Let's pray. Say, Father God, I pray for my family that you just restore their joy. You restore their peace. Your word says that our hope is found in you. Our peace is found in you. Our joy is found in you and it will overflow. So God, this morning, if there's anyone here that is lacking joy, I pray that they will get it restored from you. Because God, as the song says, we've seen you move mountains. We know that you can do it again. So God, here we are. We're crying out to you for restoration. Restoration for broken hearts and broken homes, broken spirits. Praying that you do it again. This morning, if you say, I don't know who Jesus is, I don't know how to get that joy that you're talking about, the Bible tells us that he came down and he lived a perfect life and he died for you and for me. And if you say, man, I need that joy for the first time or I lost my focus, I lost my way, I need to be restored. The Bible gives us a promise in John 3 16 when it says that he loved us so much he came and he lived the perfect life and he died a sinner's death so that we can have restoration. So this morning if that's you and you say man I I got to get back what I lost. We're going to say so we're going to say a prayer it's called a sinner's prayer and we're going to invite you to say this with us. And this is just step one. Step two is this. Galatians tells us that you have to be crucified with Christ. It's no longer your life. It's his life. And you allow him to lead, guide, and direct it. Therefore, you no longer live, but Christ now lives in you. That's how you found your joy. Let's say this prayer together. If it's the first time or a thousand times, let's say it. Father God, my life is yours. I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior. I believe you came, died, and rose again in victory. Forgive me for my sins. Restore my joy. Restore my peace. Amen. Let's give it up for those this morning that said that prayer. God's moving mountains. God's moving mountains. But listen, listen. That last slide. Don't forget it. Your joy can't be for sale. Your joy can't be for sale. Don't go home and get on social media and allow the world to steal your joy. Don't go home and start thinking about what your family did to you and allow those circumstances to steal your joy. Don't do it. Don't do it. Your joy is not for sale. The world didn't give it to you. And the world, what? Can't take it away. So my prayer is that as I... As I leave this stage, that this morning, that your joy has been restored. This morning, my prayer is that walls have been knocked down. 
and let you see Jesus on the other side. Amen. Amen. Come on up here, Brian. All right, let's give it up for Vince one more time. It's a pretty good ser sermon. Uh, trying to keep my emotions in check because y'all gonna, especially Vince and Quentin, is gonna make fun of me if I get emotional and start crying. Uh, <laughs> uh, but earlier, you know, what Scott was talking about, like lots of times we just want to give up. Uh, there's been plenty of times in my life I want to give up, but I'm gonna give some words of encouragement to Scott. I don't have to do this or Cassandra. Your calling may not be at North Church, may or may not be at North Church, but you're, you have a true calling to be a worship leader, worship pastor, whatever you want to do. You have a calling. People listen to you. When you're up here singing, people listen to you. They may not be jumping up in joy, you jumping up and down for joy, but they are truly listening to you. You command this stage, and it takes a true leader to command this stage when you come up here and worship. Same thing goes for you, Cassandra. Y'all have been a true, true blessing the past year, year and a half you've been at North Church, believe it or not. It, it may not see it half the time, you, but the proof is in the pudding. you got people that they are truly worshiping God. So don't give up. Even when you feel like giving up, don't give up. Okay? Uh, I said may or may not be. You know, obviously we want him to be here, you know, the family, but... You know, just don't give up. Even when you want to, don't give up, man. Uh, yeah, Vince just ruined the whole mood. Uh, but it's a really, really, really good service today. Um, before I forget, starting next week, we will be giving the members-only class online you can get with Quentin. If you would like to become a member of the church, there's classes that you have to partake in. Um, in order to become a member, there's certain things that we re kind of require for you to do. Uh, tonight, for Aftershock, we will not be serving pizza. I will be making seasoned spaghetti. <laughs> Evidently, when I make hamburgers for students, I don't think about the grown-ups and I don't put seasoning on it. Your face is horrible, but whatever. Uh, so, it's seasoned spaghetti. Yeah, he's, he's trying to steal my joy. And my spaghetti and my hamburgers. But uh, we will be having Aftershock tonight. Invite. You, you don't eat spaghetti? No, I'm trying to figure out what Well, ground, beef, and ketchup? ground yeah. Now I'm going to put, you know, spaghetti seasoning. Okay. Okay. You know, and, and for, for you non Americans who don't eat meat, there's going to be vegetarian spaghetti as well. Of course, things. Like noodles. noodles. Just noodles and pasta. Eh. No, you gotta have meat. No, noodles and pasta are the same. Though. No, uh, noodles, <laughs> paste, <laughs> spaghetti sauce. Uh, but no, y'all come on out, invite your friends. We had a pretty good time last week. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys tonight. Uh, before I forget, we're going to do the offering because that's one of the one of the important things of the service. Uh, we got these two buckets up here. You can come up and give cash or checks if you don't have cash. You don't have checks. We got a wonderful app you can give. You can give on called Giveify, or you can get on www.northchurchrotmark.com. You can give that way. Just give what you feel like you need to give. All right, I'm gonna say a, a, a prayer over the the offering, and I hope you guys have a great day. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, I know there's so many times we've let people, we let objects steal our joy, dear Lord. I pray, dear Lord, as we just cast those to the side, Lord, just focus on you the way we should focus on you, Lord, and let nothing steal our joy, Lord. Lord, you came on this earth to die for our sins, Lord. Lord, that's the least we can do is just be joyful for you, dear Lord. Be with us throughout our days and throughout our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.